70s when I lived in Woodstock. Uh, I lived there for a while. I was playing in a rock band, a country band, a bluegrass band, a gospel band, and a jazz band. Five, five different style bands, all within the town of Woodstock or Saugerties or something. So I was always doing these different gigs. And I started to notice this guy with a beard and a fur hat would show up at these gigs. I had no idea who he was. One day, uh, one morning I get a call, it says, hi, this is Paul Butterfield. I said, yeah, right. <laughs> I just hung up. He called me back and said, no, really, this is Paul Butterfield. I said, well, really? And I was in shock. He said, yeah, man, I've been checking you out. And he said, you probably didn't notice me, but uh, I've been checking you out and I'd like to do some playing. Are you uh, up for it? I said, yeah. <laughs> so that was the beginning of uh, a band that Paul Butterfield put together after his horn band and after he had been living in Woodstock for a while and the band was called Better Days and we did two or three albums and um, it was a great band. It was a big, big deal for me, you know, and I went from playing clubs and slapping my own stuff to going on the road and having road cases. That was like, oh my God. <laughs> You know, and I took hours stenciling my name on the road. <laughs> that was a biggie. Then uh, after that kind of ended, I moved back to New York. You know, wanted to be in the scene in New York, and Woodstock was kind of a smaller pond. I was doing tons of stuff up there. There was only the one studio, Bearsville Studio, but I was doing a lot of recording there with a lot of different people. And uh, moved back to New York and was just doing jingles and the occasional record date and more club gigs. Anyway, I went to this jingle for something, motor oil or something, and Gordon Edwards was the bass player. And he turned to me, he said, you sound pretty good, Stuffy. Why don't you come up to my club tonight? <laughs> I said, okay. And he took, gave me the address and uh, told me, just, just come up and uh, you'll sit in. I said, great, I'll see you later. So I went up that night. The drums were there set up, but there was nobody on them. And Gordon and Cornell Dupree and Richard T were on the stage. And Gordon signaled, he said, you're up, Stuffy. <laughs> so I got up and played one tune and said, thank you very much. He said, ah, don't go anywhere, Stuffy. Stay right there, Stuffy. <laughs> so I played another tune and I tried to get up again. Ah, I'll let you know when you go. I, I was concerned about the other drummer who turned out to be Herschel Dwellingham, who I never did see that night because Gordon kept having me stay, you know. By that time, Richard was saying, ah, don't go there, Richard. <laughs> and Cornell said, all right, Junior, all right, Junior. You know, and each, each tune, I had sort of loosened up a little bit more, and then I finally played a solo. And that, they were like, yes, sir, all right. He stuff, he's been doing his homework, and Junior's good. Junior's a uh, head of the class, you know, all these funny references. I was laughing as, as much as I was enjoying the playing, you know, and that was my indoctrination into what became stuff. And then maybe a year and a half later or something, I went to the Village Vanguard to hear Joe Farrell and Steve Gadd was playing. Anyway, we became friends and stuff, and one of the things we talked about was all the different styles of music, and I was admiring his jazz style and the Latin stuff he played and stuff. He said, what about R&B? I said, R&B is, uh, you know, and we talked about Al Jackson and Smokey Johnson and talked about R&B drummers. He said, I'd, I'd like to play some of that. I said, I have just the band for you. <laughs> <laughs> and when I'm not doing it, I'll call you to sub. So I don't know how long how much time passed after that, but I called him and said, you know, Gordon is uh, waiting for you. And so Steve, I, I think I went on the road with the Brecker brothers, so I was out of town for a while, and I said, Steve, the chair is open. So he started going up with Richard and Cornell and Gordon. And by the time I came back, whatever it was, six months later or something like that, Gordon said, you better watch out, Junior. Uh, the new stuff he is, he's <laughs> gonna put a flame on your and, and of course he did. So then I would do it or Steve would do it. I would do it or Steve would do it. And finally one night Gordon said, you know what? I want you both here tomorrow night. And we said, two sets of drums? Cool, we're, we're there, you know? And we, we, to this day, never discussed, you know, I'll play cross stick and you go to the bell or I'll do this thing on the hi-hat and you do the bell. We never discussed what we were gonna play, how we were gonna play it, or the approach, or any of that stuff. It was all just sat down, two sets of drums, three, four, and we 
started to play together from that moment on, and that that was a serious turning point. And to have Steve Gadd on the other drum set was like heaven, you know? Here's a guy who, who is such a great player and such a great musician, you know, that any, anything we play gets to this level and higher. You know, we're not, this is not a jam band or anything else. Uh, this is not a chops contest or a cutting contest. We both had this approach without discussing it at all that was completely musical and completely locked in with Cornell and Richard. Soon after that, Eric Gale joined the band and that, that really became stuff. Two drummers, two guitar players, bass and piano.